Today, there are two types of Striker Cavalry. Cavalry Squadrons part of Striker Brigade combat teams, and the 2nd and 3rd Cavalry Regiments. The former are battalion-sized units that conduct reconnaissance and security operations for the Striker Infantry Brigade. The latter are themselves Striker Brigade combat teams, largely infantry formations with cav traditions. However, at one point the army was planning on creating a different type of striker cavalry, units crafted in the mold of the classic armored cavalry regiments, which are probably my favorite type of unit, but mounted on strikers. It would have been an interesting mix of scouts, 105mm gun strikers, artillery, and aviation, and filled a specialized role that today remains unfilled. Today, we'll learn how the Striker ACR would have been organized and equipped had it made it into service. Armored Cavalry Regiments or ACRs were brigade-sized units with 4,000 to 4,600 personnel. They were self-contained combined arms organizations with enough organic fires and support to operate independently. In the early 2000s, there were four ACRs in different configurations. Second ACR Light was the Humvee Mounted Formation. They worked for the 18th Airborne Corps, the Contingency Corps including the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, 10th Mountain Division, and 3rd Infantry Division. Third ACR was a traditional heavy ACR, equipped mainly with the M3 Bradley and M1 Abrams. They worked for the Armored 3 Corps, which included the 1st Armored, 1st Cavalry, and 1st and 4th Infantry Divisions. 11th ACR was similar to the 3rd, but under strength with no aviation, artillery, or air defense. It was and remains the opposing force at Fort Irwin's National Training Center. And lastly, the 278th ACR was the only one part of the Army National Guard. It was similar to the 3rd ACR, based on tanks and Bradleys, complete with a 4th aviation squadron and a dedicated reconnaissance and security mission. But over the course of Iraq and Afghanistan, each regiment evolved. The 278th ACR was one of the first to go. After deploying to Iraq in 2004-2005 as a regimental combat team, it was reorganized as a heavy brigade combat team based on tanks and infantry. Shortly after, in 2006, 2nd ACR became a regular Striker Brigade combat team due to the need for infantry. It was redesignated as the 2nd Striker Cavalry Regiment under 5th Corps and re-garrisoned in Germany. After 11th ACR's 2005-2006 deployment to Iraq, it was also reorganized as a deployable heavy BCT with significant National Guard augmentation and 3rd ACR finally went as the last proper ACR in 2011 when it too was converted into a Striker BCT. 2nd ACR was always slated to receive the Striker, but initially it was going to become a novel cavalry organization structured like a normal ACR. The Striker was originally intended to fill a gap between light forces, which were highly air mobile but lacked combat power, and heavy forces, which had plenty of combat power but relied on sea lift or pre positioned stocks to get into theater. The army originally wanted a Striker Brigade to be air transportable anywhere in the world within four days, and for a Striker to fit in a C 130, one of the smallest airlifters in the Air Force's inventory. This didn't fully pan out. The Striker Brigade is designed to be flown or shipped to any trouble spot anywhere in the world within 96 hours, a goal the Pentagon admits is not even remotely possible yet. Further, carrying a Striker in a C-130 with 2,000 pounds of mission essential equipment, ammo, or personnel decreased the aircraft's range to a mere 500 miles or 805 kilometers. That's less than the distance between Paris and Berlin and half the original requirement. Strikers also couldn't be flown in C-130s with their add-on armor installed, which would have added an additional 10 hours of prep time on the ground. But the air mobility advantage was still on everyone's minds when the Striker Regiment was being conceived, so it's key context. As far as what the regiment's purpose would have been, the ACR's job was to provide the Corps with fresh information, reaction time and maneuver space, preserve combat power, restore command and control, facilitate movement, and when not performing other missions, secure the rear area. 
To do this, they conducted reconnaissance, economy of force, and security missions. To translate that into English, reconnaissance is the most straightforward. They're trying to answer unknowns that the commander needs answered. This usually meant collecting information about the enemy, like their size, location, direction, and rate of advance, or the terrain. This could also mean seeking out friendly forces if communication systems have been destroyed or jammed. Elements of an ACR could be used to find an out-of-contact friendly force and re-establish C2 for a division or core. Economy of force missions, meanwhile, are at their core when a smaller force does a job that would otherwise require a bigger force. They aren't really one specific thing. Economy of force missions could really almost be anything. This is generally to allow for resources to be prioritized to the main effort. For example, if the core is attacking in one direction and needs the bulk of its divisions off doing that, but this creates a gap where there's a chance of enemy attack, the ACR or one of its squadrons could be slotted in there in lieu of a division to defend. That's using a battalion or brigade-sized force to do what it would otherwise require a division. It's economizing force. Security operations, meanwhile, protect a supported force. There are multiple types, such as the screen, guard, cover, area security, route security, but for the sake of brevity, I'll highlight the main one ACRs were expected to do, act as a covering force. Covering forces would have been positioned forward, on the flank, or rear of the core to deny the enemy information about the main body, conduct reconnaissance along the main body's axis of advance, defeat, repel, or fix enemy forces, develop the situational understanding of the enemy, and exploit opportunities until the main body was committed. At low levels, an ACR subunits would be conducting a mix of reconnaissance, screens, attacks, defenses, and delays as part of the overall regimental cover mission. In the defense, a covering force aimed to attrite the enemy's lead elements to the point of forcing them to commit their second echelon prematurely. This gave the friendly core the best shot at reaching their objective with the combat power available, as the ACR did a lot of the work by destroying or repelling the enemy's recon and security forces, and significantly degrading or destroying their first echelon. A covering force also provided early warning of the enemy like a screening force, which gave the core commander more time and space to react. But unlike in a screen, which may only impede or harass an enemy, a covering force sought to do some real damage. They could become decisively engaged with the enemy, meaning they're committed and the battle must be fought to its final conclusion. A decisive covering action could start and end before the main body divisions were ever engaged. The covering force operated independently of the main body, often outside of artillery range. If an ACR was covering for a core, it could be 50 to 60 kilometers in front of the closest friendly division. That's why the ACR had its own artillery and attack aviation. Probably the most famous example of an ACR acting as a covering force was the second ACR during Desert Storm, typified by the Battle of 73 Easting. Second ACR's job was to lead 7th Corps' attack to ease the main body's forward movement prevent premature deployment, destroy what enemy forces they could, and locate the enemy's main defensive lines. At the low level, this looked like an attack that destroyed two Iraqi armored brigades. But at the macro level, this was a security operation that spared the main body divisions from committing early and gathered intelligence through combat that informed the deployment of the 1st Infantry Division. The problem with the light ACR, though, was it was equipped with Humvees. These were not well suited to the very aggressive covering force task, nor for offensive reconnaissance tasks that require attacking the enemy to gather information. Second ACR was meant to receive more capable equipment at various points. The M8 light tank, a new scout vehicle, M113s perhaps, although that was all cancelled. This is where the new, better protected strikers would have come in. Scout Humvees would have been subbed out with the striker reconnaissance vehicle, Humvee towed 120s with striker mortar carriers, tow Humvees with the mobile gun system, and the M93 Fox with the NBC recon striker. The overall regiment would have consisted of a headquarters and headquarters troop, equivalent to a company, three ground cav squadrons, equivalent to a battalion, a regimental aviation squadron, support squadron, engineer company, signal company, 
intelligence company, and target acquisition platoon, which was primarily counterbattery radars and meteorology. Notably, the redesign removed the light ACR's air defense artillery battery, which had 24 Humvee-mounted Avenger surface-to-air missile systems. This left the Stryker Cavalry Regiment with no organic air defense. At the lowest level, the new Stryker Scout Platoon would have had four reconnaissance vehicles. They're distinctive for their long-range scout surveillance system mounted next to the weapon, a 50 cal or Mark 19. The initial plan circa 2004 was for each Stryker to have eight personnel. In two vehicles, they'd have a squad leader, a Stryker commander, driver, team leader, and four dismount scouts. The platoon leader and platoon sergeant's vehicles had a striker gunner as well, but only three scouts. My guess is that this was to allow the PL and platoon sergeant to dismount while still having three crew members in the vehicle. This would give a total of about 18 dismounts, not including the platoon leader or platoon sergeant. Each striker would carry an M240 medium MG and a javelin for the dismounts, who would otherwise only be armed with M4 carbines and some M203s. This was a little different from the reconnaissance platoon design for Stryker Brigade RSTA squadrons. That called for a section leader, gunner, driver, scout, and human intelligence collector for two of the vehicles. The platoon sergeant's vehicle would have had a team leader instead of a scout, and the platoon leader's vehicle would have had a team leader in addition to a scout. This design had half the dismounts, and four of them were human specialists. This was obviously influenced by stability operations. Lots of getting out of the striker to talk to civilians and conduct foot patrols through populated areas. The troop would have two of these scout platoons. They would have been supported by a mobile gun system platoon. As autoloaded vehicles, these would have each been crewed by three personnel and served a 105mm tank gun to provide scouts with direct fire support. The proposed design for the Stryker Cav Regiment called for four MGSs per platoon, but follow-up MGS platoon designs for the Stryker BCT called for three vehicles instead, so it's possible they could have adopted that structure later on. A mortar section with a Humvee and two Stryker mortar carriers supported the troop with self-propelled 120s. The 2004 proposal included a trailer for the mortar carriers, although in later TONEs, these weren't an authorized item. It's likely these sections would have gotten a 5-ton truck and trailer in lieu of a Humvee and carrier-towed trailers. The Troop HQ would have included a recon vehicle for the commander, a command vehicle for the executive officer to act as the troop command post, and two Humvees, one for the commander out of combat and one for a retransmission team. The troop trains were initially intended to have an infantry carrier vehicle for the first sergeant, although this seems like something that would have been replaced later with a Humvee, plus a maintenance contact Humvee for the motor sergeant, a Hemet Wrecker, and a 2.5 truck with a water trailer for the supply sergeant. From the squadron's HQ troop, the CAV troop would have also been directly supported by a fire support team or fist on a fire support striker, a troop medevac section on a striker ambulance, and a troop support team with a Hemet fuel tanker and flatbed trailer. Each CAV squadron was templated for four of these CAV troops with no separate MGS company. Squadrons also had a field artillery battery with six M198 155mm howitzers towed by five-ton trucks. Had the regiment remained in this configuration, they would have been replaced by M777s in the late 2000s. The headquarters and headquarters troop included the main command, fire support coordination, and logistical elements. The squadron commander and operations officer, or S3, each got their own striker. There were also eight fire support strikers, four of which were for the fire support teams attached to CAV troops, six ambulances, and a bunch of other light-skinned vehicles. This accounted for roughly 84 strikers per CAV squadron, or 252 across the three. The regimental headquarters also had 17. Half were command vehicles for various staff and command sections, but eight were meant to be NBC reconnaissance variants for the NBC Recon Platoon, which replaced the legacy ACR chemical company on the German Fuchs-derived M93. The regimental engineer company had an additional 17 strikers, mainly the engineer squad vehicle variant. 
So as originally envisioned, the regiment would have roughly 286 strikers of all variants except the tow missile carrier, which I find a little strange, maybe they would have added a little later. 48 of the strikers would have been the mobile gun system. Moving on to the regimental aviation squadron, it would have consisted of a headquarters and headquarters troop, an assault troop, three air recon troops, an attack troop, aviation unit maintenance troop, aviation maintenance troop, and aviation intermediate maintenance electronic equipment test team. The assault troop provided a limited air assault and aerial delivery capability, as well as command and control and limited aeromedical augmentation. It would have included six UH-60 Mike Blackhawks and two EUH-60 Limas for airborne C2. One would be provided to the regimental HQ to carry an assistant effects coordinator from the artillery branch, a cavalry battle captain, operations NCO, and intelligence sergeant. The troop would normally be split up to support individual ground cav squadrons. This set the ACRs apart from divisional cavalry squadrons, which despite having aviation would have to request to lift assets for ground recon forces from division. Air recon troops would have eight OH-58 Delta Kiowa Warrior Scout helicopters for a total of 24 in the regiment. The assumption was 75% of these aircraft would be available at any one time, so 18 aircraft in the field theoretically. Air recon troops could act under the parent squadron or be task organized under a ground cav squadron depending on the situation. The attack troop would have a total of 9 Apache attack helicopters, or 6 continuously operational assuming 75% availability, 3 with the longbow fire control radars. Apaches and Kiowas would often be task organized to form scout weapons teams. This would basically entail the mission commander aboard a Kiowa as the lead, focusing on reconnoitering the objective, coordinating with higher and adjacent units, and marking targets, while the Apache as the wingman acted as the primary shooter to protect the Aero Scout. But the attack helicopters could also operate in Apache-only teams, either three teams of two aircraft each, or a heavy and light team mix, one team with four aircraft and another team with two aircraft. Overall, the Regimental Aviation Squadron provided a flexible force that could cover ground quickly regardless of terrain, but was limited by weather and enemy air defense capabilities. They could provide timely intelligence across a much larger area and quicker than ground cav units, and the Apache Attack Helicopter Troop could fix or destroy enemy forces with their cannon, rocket, and Hellfire missile armament, prevent enemy penetrations, and rapidly exploit success but generally to do both would limit 24-hour operations and narrow the area which was covered by aviation. Outside the aviation squadron, the military intelligence company also maintained a drone surveillance capability with four RQ-7 Shadow UAVs. Moving on, the support squadron was the regiment's high-level logistical element, basically like today's brigade support battalion. The support squadron consisted of an HQ and HQ troop, distribution troop, medical troop, and maintenance troop, for about 535 soldiers in total. As far as attachments that could be made to the regiment for a covering mission, options in 90s doctrine included maneuver battalion task forces to act as a reserve, a cavalry squadron from a division, an attack helicopter battalion, artillery brigade, engineer battalion, air defense artillery, military intelligence and electronic warfare, and combat service support elements. Thank you to my patrons and channel members who keep this content free and sustainable. Check out the rest of this series where I look at military units that were planned but never made it into service. I'll see you over there.